Welcome to the No Unfinished Business Podcast. There are a thousand different ways your clients can leave unfinished business, but no single advisor can address every issue. In every episode, we'll answer the important questions to help professional advisors focused on individual clients, attorneys, CPAs, and financial advisors, identify and eliminate those planning blind spots so you can speak competently and confidently to your clients and help them leave no unfinished business. Jen Hernandez, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, we brought you on because, well, prices have gone up in houses, which means people have more and more equity to deal with. And so what should they be thinking about with all of this equity that they can do? Yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon. So there's some creative things that we can do through, for current homeowners through a cash out refinance. In the state of Texas, you can have loans on your property up to 80% of the whatever the value is, we would do an appraisal. So using equity, other than just the obvious things like improvements to the house, repairs, for financial planning, we could lower the monthly payment, you know, get on a new 30-year amortization in order to create cash flow for payment of other things that they might want to do in their finances. We could pay off IRS tax liens. They might have some back debt that's accumulated through years or recent or whatever. We could refinance that in if there's enough equity to do that. They could do some again, we could give them a lot we give them a lump sum in cash so they could use that to purchase an insurance policy or pay off other debt, high credit card debt. So those are just some of the creative financial things that we see people do with the equity. Yeah, and just in terms of what's coming in right now, what for the the clients who clients of our listeners who may be listening and like, oh, we've got this equity, how long should they be prepping for a process for this? You know, what sort of lead time do they need for? Yeah, that's a great question. Forty five days, I would say. Um, just it depends on how quickly we get the paperwork. Really, it's about thirty, but depending on how motivated the people are with paperwork, I would say that's red flag number one is if they sit on it, then we can't do what we need to do. But 30 to 45 days. And on a rescission, if there's a tight timeline that we're working with, when you do a cash out, there is a rescission period. There's a three day, you know, we sign at the title company and then there's a three day rescission and they don't have the money till that third business day. So, you know, we work that whole timeline with them. When, okay, when just, the yeah, if you sign on Monday, you're not getting your cash until Thursday? Friday. Friday. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so three whole days, not... Three full days, yeah, after okay. the sign date. Yeah, yeah and uh, when we're thinking about something like this, we also use it just upgrade the house you're pulling the equity out of. Are there any additional requirements because it's going to be used back on the house or does it become easier if you're doing something to improve the house you're pulling the equity out of? There's no requirement of what you use the money for other than if the money, if we have to pay off debt, if the person has too much debt and their payments are too high, so their debt to income ratio is out of whack, then there might be a forced debt payoff through the refi to where the title company will actually issue the certified check so we know that it's paid. But other than that, whatever cash is in their pocket that's wired to them on that third day, we don't really care what they use it for. As long as they qualify for the payment, they can use it for really whatever they want. We don't make them sign a document or it's not restricted at all. As long as, like I said, the debt that's remaining is sufficed by whatever their income is. That's interesting. You'd mentioned that there might be a certified check that goes to one of those, you know, whatever prior creditor, they're going to get paid off and closed out to make sure that there's nobody ahead of the lender. For sure. Yes. I was talking mostly from, let's say, credit card debt, but if there's something like an IRS tax lien, uh, that's pending and looming out there, you definitely can't refinance your house unless that's paid off because IRS, no matter what, always trumps the lien. So that's never waivable. So any IRS lien, and that would prevent them from selling in the future as well until that's paid off. But at the refi, if we refi and there is an IRS lien, for example, when you're talking about lien position, that definitely would have to be taken care of. But other than that, 
you know, when it's just regular credit card debts or installment car loans, things like that, those aren't going to be ahead of our lien anyway. So it's just anything that's delinquent, like IRS, HOA back, you know, back taxes. Sometimes we can use it to catch them up in that situation. Again, as long as they qualify, because if we see that they have negative things like this, usually the credit follows to where the credit will mirror that hard spot that they're in. So it all really depends on how the credit is. What right. People. Yeah. Just getting a chance to get your head above water doesn't always mean it's going to be easy, even if you've got that equity in there. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Okay. Well, just in terms of thinking about it, you'd mentioned having these existing liens or other debts that are out there. Are there anything else, any other issues that potential borrower should be thinking about now so they're not surprised about it later? Yeah, I would say, you know, just Credit is always the number one thing that's the gateway, right? Without the credit score, when you do the cash out, you really need in the 700s usually. So just if someone is going through a hard time and they're sharing it with you, their financial advisor or CPA or whatever professional you're in, just at all costs, they have to try to make thing, payments on time because that will prevent them from in the future being able to do something. So if you've got a client that's going through hard times, just be like, please, like, what can I do to help you form a spreadsheet so you can keep track of anything they can get their hands on to keep them current on payments. The other thing is we are seeing in hard times, you know, a lot of people are getting divorced. And so a lot of people don't know that if you are still legally married, Texas does not recognize separation at least in the lending community property state, that spouse must sign these documents and know what you're doing. You cannot refinance your house and get cash out without your legal spouse knowing. So that's really, really important that we have to know or that is the that, client needs to know. Right. So is that for just a house that would be community property or any house if you are married? Yeah, that's a good question. Investment property doesn't count as long as they're not on title. If they're on title, they're going to have to sign away something. And you can cash out on investment properties, by the way, up to 75%. So that's a possibility as well. But it's just primary residence that has that spouse must sign rule on it. And on the investment property, again, it just depends if they're on title already or not. Right. It, you know, if they're, if they're on title, plan on make plan on including them in the process yeah. and you probably my guess is you probably need something from them even if it is separate property one spouse saying oh yeah it's my separate property don't worry about it you'd probably yeah, still know. want that spouse the other spouse saying yes that's right that's the other spouse's sole property yeah, yeah we really not. do I think just if someone is still legally married, like it had the divorce has not been final, they just need to get to a lender as soon as possible just to make sure that what they're wanting to do, they can do, et cetera, et cetera. That's usually the biggest kink that we sometimes see. Yeah. And the other point to go back to, yes, we have common law marriage here in Texas, but there is no common law divorce. And so ultimately you're going to need some something confirming either you're no longer married or again, your spouse is signing something at when you pull the equity out of it. You know, we just had that come up recently. So for those CPA professionals that are listening, these, they, this couple is, they're sing, they're unmarried, but they've lived together a while. I think they have a kid together. And last year on their tax return, they decided to file jointly as if they were married, but they're like, no, we're, we're not married. And so the, this particular loan, it was a problem because, and it wasn't a refi, it was just a loan, but they said, no, but we're not married. I'm like, well, why did you file jointly? They're like, well, because we could get some reduction in taxes. So just just let people know that when they portray themselves to the government as being married on a tax return, even if they're not married, like you talked about the common law part, it has other repercussions like signing on a refi. If you're telling the government you're married, you're married. And right. it just and, comes with that as well. Yeah, potentially we could argue about that in court, but that's not where we want to do this. No. And picking <laughs> picking and choosing where to do that, they ha as you said, could have other downstream consequences later. Yeah, yeah that's true. 
Vancouver. Um, all right. So anything else? I mean, in terms of problems, uh, you know, I, what I think about the times where I've had people call up either on their behalf, on their own behalf, or a title agent say, hey, we just need to get this signed. So how do we how do we overcome these other li divorce lien that surviving or not surviving a divorced spouse has and they're supposed to get paid when we sell the house? How do we get around that? It's like, well, no, you don't. You got to pay. I mean, you'd have to pay them first. I mean, we do. We also do refinances like it's not really a home equity cash out. So the important thing to know for people in Texas to know professionals is that on your homestead property, there are rules around taking cash out that have to be followed. There's cooling off periods. There's things that have to be signed special. There's all kinds of special rules, max loan to value, all that. In the case of a divorce, or it's interesting you mention it, or having to refinance to pay the other spouse off, there's a way we can do it without having to go under those home equity laws and we can actually exceed that 80%. It's super creative, but it's using an ulti lien to for that divorced spouse to convey their percentage of the property over to the remaining person and we can cash out half of the remaining equity to the one that's remaining so it, it, it and it won't fall through these cash out guidelines that are required it's just texas is a little strange we were the last state in the u.s to allow you to take cash out of your equity. We couldn't do it until 1998. Oh, yeah. so it's not a normal thing. Yeah, it's it was not a normal thing up until then. Yeah. So lots of rules around that. And then think about the application process. What snags are people going to run into? What are the common things that you see, you know, beyond the liens and the other debts? What's holding up the process for folks? Um, it, it's just giving us documents. It's refinancing is almost similar to purchasing it and that we have to qualify you all over again. Even if you have a bunch of equity, we can't turn our eye or ignore the fact. I mean, everyone has to do paperwork. You know, when they're self-employed, they need two years tax returns unless you've been there for if you've been self-employed for five years we can get away with one so that's been important just because coming off of covid a lot of people in 20 and 21 didn't have good tax returns yet so 2022 is a lot better so it's great to get away with that one year so i would say that that paperwork for those non-w2 employees if they're self-employed there's ways around it there's bank statement programs, you might pay a little higher rate, but you can use bank statements to show um, income versus we, we look at deposits and then we okay. just take a certain percentage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not that you have enough that there's necessarily so much money in the bank account, but looking at how much is deposited on a normal paycheck timeline. Yeah. We'll usually take like 50% because there's some CPAs that are super good and they write off everything and that's okay until you want a mortgage so if there's not enough after expense i mean we can add back in for depreciation and mileage and a couple non-cash expense things but other than that that bottom line number on your schedule c or k1 or whatever it is that's the number we use after expenses so it can get a little tricky there's some solutions to that, like I said, a little bit higher rate, but I would say paperwork and just getting us everything because we're going to find out anyway. So just be forthcoming, get us everything that we need so we can help you through this transition, obviously on a cash out, especially if we're using the equity, you need it for something, right? So we want to help them as quickly as we can. Um, documents is always the key. It's always the missing link and lack thereof. Um, so just putting urgency around that. Excellent. Any recent developments, anything else that people may not be aware of as they start down this process? No, I, I would just say one of the biggest uh, objections that I get is, well, I've got all this equity. Why does it matter? I should just be able to sign and get the loan. And it's just not that way. You have to have credit intact. You've got to get us documents and make enough income to support your payments. Just as simple as that. It's just math. And that's probably the only thing is just, just the realization that 
having equity, yes, is a good thing, but we still have to justify whatever debt is remaining. You know, Got we it. still have to go through the process. So just being patient with that is my biggest thing. Got it. Well, this is probably a good place to close off for right now. Jen, if our listeners are lo looking to find you, where can they find you? Yeah, all my handles, my website, everything is Loan with Jen. So uh, it's L O A N W I T H J E N J E N, loanwithjen.com or at loanwithjen on social media. So you could find me there. Great. Thanks so much for stopping by. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for listening. You can find more episodes, videos, and links to more helpful content at nounfinishedbusiness.com. If you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for topics, please reach out via social media or email john at john at strohmeyerlaw.com. And of course, if you or your clients need help from John with an estate planning, probate, trust, or cross-border tax issue, you can book time directly with John at askjohnaquestion.com. 